have come to the 51st class on the study of the life of Elisha. Today, we will be looking to the last miracle that Elisha performed. This miracle he performed at his sick bed. Not much later, we see that uh, the completion of his prophetic ministry was uh, done and uh, he was called home. So uh, we move on to the 16th miracle. It is in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19. We have uh, had classes from chapter 7 last week. And from 8, we had earlier, so we are making a long leap from 7 to 13 to go on to the uh, 16th miracle. This miracle speaks about uh, empowering King Joash to claim victory over the Syrian king. The scripture portion, as I mentioned, is 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19. And the theme of this miracle is The eternal God fulfills his plan through the mortal man. That is the theme of this miracle. The eternal God fulfills his plan through the mortal man. The portion, as I mentioned, is 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19. We will have a quick look to the portion and then we will come back and maybe we will look to verse 14 only today. And God willing, in the coming weeks, we will study the miracle proper. Let's go through the passage. 2 Kings chapter 13 verses 14 onwards. When Elisha became sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash the king of Israel came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then Elisha said to to, him, to the king of Israel, lay your hand on the bow. And he laid his hand on it. Then Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the window towards the east. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. He, so he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory and the arrow of victory over Aram. For you will defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you have put an end to them. Verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground, and he struck it three times and stopped. Then the man of God became angry at him and said, you should have struck five or six times, then you would have struck a ram until you put an end to them. But now you shall strike a ram only three times. This is the last miracle that... Uh, Elisha performed while upon his sick bed. And this speaks about the incident, the last miracle that he performed. We will have a closer look to it to understand some spiritual truths from even that miracle. Moving back to the first verse that we are now, we will look at it today, even the half of that verse. The first part of verse 14 of chapter 13 says, when Elisha became sick with illness of which he was to die. Elisha was quite a young man when he was called by prophet Elijah. Then we learned that he served Elijah for about 10 to 13 years. For 60 long years, Elisha's prophetic ministry continued, including the time that he spent with his master Elijah. Now the time period is complete. He is about 80 now, and he is on the sick bed now. The mighty prophet of God, Elisha, is on his sick bed at this point of time. Who is this sick and weak man on bed? Just have a look at him. A man who persistently followed his master to get double portion of his spirit. A prophet who performed double number of miracles than his master Elijah performed. A committed man of God who faithfully served God among the people who were disobedient, ungodly, and apostates. He is that prophet who is on the sick bed now. A man who persistently followed his master to get double portion of his spirit to perform 
wonderful things for God, a prophet who performed double number of miracles than his master Elijah performed, and a committed man of God who faithfully served God among ungodly people, among the people who were disobedient, among the people who were ungodly, and among the people who were apostates. Now he is old, he is weak, he is sick, and now he is bedridden. A faithful prophet who deserves and can demand a far better end of life than his master Elijah. Are you following me? A very faithful prophet who can deserve and who can demand a far better end of life than his master Elijah. But now we see him on his sick bed. He is not asking for a vibrant, energetic, and dynamic health like Elijah and to have a walk over to heaven without any old age, weakness, or sickness. He is not asking for a similar or better end of life like his master. We know how Elijah was uh, taken to heaven without seeing death. And he was a witness for that. And he, by his persistence following him, he claimed the double power of the spirit that worked in his master Elijah. And he was able to serve the Lord for three, six decades, for the long the 60 years, and now on the sick bed. But he is not asking for a vibrant or energetic, dynamic health like Elijah and a walk over to heaven without any old age, difficulties, weakness, or sickness. He is not asking for a, a similar life and like Elijah had. We see him prepared to accept the present weakness and sickness and suffer a normal death with pain and sorrows. On his sick bed, we see him content. He see him satisfied with all the weakness, with all the sickness, and with all the suffering, and to undergo a normal death with pain and sorrows. We see him very keen, very persistent for receiving better spiritual blessings than his master. He was persistently following him. He said, I will not go back unless I get the double portion of the spirit of my master. He was so persistent to get double portion of the spirit of his master, power of the spirit that worked in his master. But he is not asking for a better physical blessing. He is not asking for a comfortable end of life than his master. He is not concerned about that at all. He leaves it to God to decide how his life should end. When he was very firm in getting spiritual blessings, he is not bothered about physical blessing or material blessings. He is not asking for a better end of life like his master. He's not concerned about that. He is willingly submitting himself to the will of God he was ready to be on his sick bed. He was ready to be as a weak man on his bed. And he was ready to accept a normal death with pain and sorrows. When and where and how to die. He left it to God without any preference of his own. When he had so much of preference concerning his spiritual blessings, when he was so persistent about uh, spiritual strength, spiritual attainments, when and where and how to die, he left it to God without any preference of his own. Oh dear ones, this is the reflection of true godliness. This is the reflection of true godliness. We can derive the first lesson from here. Lesson one, 
let us be persistent and importunate before God for our spiritual blessings, but let's be totally submissive to the will of God for our physical and material blessings. This is the first lesson that we can learn from the sickbed of this great and mighty servant of God, prophet of God, Elisha. Let us be persistent and importunate before God for our spiritual blessings. But let's be totally submissive to the will of God for our physical and material blessings. To be very frank, dear ones, let me tell you, we are generally the other way around. We are very keen and importunate for our material and physical needs, and we are least bothered about our spiritual needs many a times. Do you want me to repeat that again? We are generally very keen and importunate for our material and physical needs, but we are least bothered about our spiritual needs many a times. That is the real condition of our life. That's a failure of our life. We know we are passing through very difficult and perilous time. As mentioned in the beginning, uncertainty all over the world. From the human point of view, tomorrow is totally blurred before our eyes. What is our lot ahead? We don't know. We are hearing the saddening news of sudden death of our dear ones. Even at this stage, being children of God, we have no right to demand anything better for our physical or material comfort or betterment. What we really need to do is to be steadfast and persistent before God to bring about spiritual blessings out of this pandemic time. Let me repeat that, please. What we really need to do is to be steadfast and persistent before God to bring about spiritual blessings out of this pandemic situation. We have no right to question God. Our question should, to God should be, how can I bring spiritual blessings in my life out of this perilous time? This would be our question. How can I bring out spiritual blessings in my life out of these perilous, difficult, troublesome times? All the issues of our health, our physical comfort, our material needs, our social uncertainties, and even the issue of life or death, leave it to God. Leave it to God. He will take care of it. Let his will be done in our life. Dear ones, that is the best for us. Even today afternoon when I was preparing this message, I got a message from one of our assembly members. Probably some of you also got that. It came in our group. He said he is going for PCR test and he was asking for prayer that the result would be negative. Yes, that's what all of us desire and earnestly pray for. But what is the will of God? We should know that that is the best concerning us. When I wanted to give an answer to that, you know, to, to encourage him, the message that God gave me is that I just mentioned like this, may the Lord take care of what is best in the will of God be allowed, keeping in prayer. Yes, even when we pray for being escaped from the calamities, even we pray for sparing us from difficulties, problems, and uh, the after effects of this pandemic situation, we should have that dedication, that commitment deep in our heart that in spite of my earnest desire and prayer that the Lord would spare me from all these difficulties. Lord, your will be done in my life. Lord, it is your will that is best for me. It is your plan concerning my life is the best for me, not my choice, 
not my desire. And let's have that commitment. Let's have that dedication in our life for dear ones, even when we earnestly pray for sparing us from all the calamities, from all the problems that we are passing through these days. So we can have the second lesson. The need of the hour is to be steadfast and persistent before God to bring about spiritual blessings out of the worst situation we are in now. This is the real need of the hour, dear ones. The real need of the hour is to be steadfast and persistent before God to bring about spiritual blessings in our life out of the worst situation that we are in now. Do not question for God for our present situation. If God has arranged Corona as our vehicle to be removed from this earth, or if God allows Corona as a vehicle for our dear ones to transport them from this world to the world eternal, let us not ask God why. Let us not ask God why. If God allows an extreme struggle to survive in this pandemic situation, please do not question God or doubt his love. Just thank the Lord for the past and have a closer walk with God during the present days, leaving the future in the hands of the Lord. Yes, dear ones, just thank God for the past, the wonderful way he has led us so far, the manifold blessings that we enjoyed in our life. Just thank God for the past and have a closer walk with the Lord during this present pandemic situation and leave the future in the hands of God. Think of Elisha. On many occasions, God used him to heal others. But now, God appointed this illness to be the means to remove Elisha from this world. He is not asking God why. He is not comparing his life end with his master's life end. Even though he was much mightily used by God than his master. You understand? Even though Elisha was much mightily used by God than his master Elijah, he is not asking God why this sickness, why this weakness, why this sickbed for me when my master was taken straight away to heaven without seeing death without undergoing such a difficulties, pain, weakness, and sorrow. He is not concerned about that. Oh, dear ones, God has many ways to enrich us spiritually. God has many ways to transport us from this world to the world eternal. Any of such means is not inferior or superior to other. We should know that. Any of such means is not inferior or superior to the other. God's ways are perfect. You know, some will die all of a sudden. Even we were shocked by the news of death of dear brother uh, Shaluti Nainan. At the same time, some will be on sick but for a long time with pain and suffering. Some will die in conscious mind, while others may remain unconscious or suffer from dementia, memory loss for a long time. Now, when allowed to continue miserably on sick bed or under the attack of dementia, we ask God, why is such sufferings to godly people? Isn't it? At least that question comes into our mind. Why so much of difficulties? So much of afflictions to the people of God, to mighty men of God. And also when people die without much sickness or struggle, 
we say it was a blessed death, isn't it? Sometimes we use that phrase, blessed death. But I just want to make you know, understand that it is not how we die determines the blessedness of our death, but how we are going to be after the death determines the blessedness. Did you get me? It is not how we die determines the blessedness of our death, but how we are going to be after the death determines the blessedness of our death. We have that verse in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. We all know that verse very well. To depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better. That is far better. To depart from this life and to be with the Lord. That is the blessed experience. That is the blessedness of our death. Not the mode of death. Or the way we die. Not the, the, the end time experiences. It has nothing to do with blessedness of our death. Please keep that in our mind. So we have the third lesson. Blessedness of death is not determined by the mode of death, but it is determined by our heavenly estate after the death. Now, it is good to have a peaceful death, not a suffering too much. Of course, it is good, but that doesn't make the death a blessed death. Do not define that death as a blessed death. That is the lot God has allowed to that person. For another person, it is the will of God to continue on his sick bed for some time, even for a longer period, to suffer pain, sometimes to continue in, uh, in the memory loss, difficulties. It is God who decide how to end a life of his child. And there is nothing like blessedness or not blessedness with regard to the end of life experience of a believer. But the blessedness is absolutely depends on the, the experience, the blessing that we enjoy after death. The nearness to the Lord after our death, when we depart from this life. The honor, the comfort we are going to enjoy in the presence of God. The reward that we receive in his presence. The responsibilities that will be given to us to shoulder in the millennial kingdom and in the eternity. All these things determine our blessedness of earth, of death. This is enjoyed only by the children of God. This is the privilege of only the true believers, the children of God, to be to enjoy the nearness of the Lord at their death, after their death, to be honored and to be comforted in the presence of God, to be rewarded in His presence, and to be imparted responsibilities in the millennial kingdom and in the coming eternity. All these are the privileges that can be claimed by the believers alone. And this is the blessedness of death. Now, let me tell you a reality. Blessedness of death will not be same to all. Please keep this in your mind. Blessedness of death will not be same to you all, will not be enjoyed equally by all. It will vary from believer to believer. How? It will be proportionate to the way we love the Lord, we obey the Lord, we honor the Lord, and we serve the Lord while we are upon this earth. Understand? So keep in your mind, blessedness of death is not the mode of death or the end of life experience. Blessedness of death is the status, the estate that we are going to have after death. That is the blessedness of our death. And also remember, it is exclusively for believers, for children of God alone. And again, remember, the blessedness of 
our death is not equal to all. It is not uniform. It is proportionate to the way we love the Lord, the way we obey the Lord, the way we honor the Lord, the way we serve the Lord while we are upon this earth. So we have the clue how to make our death most blessed. You understand? So you got the clue how to make your death most blessed by loving the Lord, by obeying the Lord, by honoring the Lord, by serving the Lord according to the will of God with commitment throughout our life that our death will be reckoned as a blessed death and we may be able to enjoy the best of the blessedness of death after our life on earth. May the Lord truly help us. Well, <clears throat> there is nothing wrong in anticipating and praying for a peaceful death without much miserable days uh, during the close of our earthly life. Yes, we can anticipate, we can pray for, to some extent, even we can prepare for that. But still, what is our portion in the will of God should be accepted and uh, should be underwent joyfully. We have no question. We have no right to question it. We have no right to, to be unhappy about it. It is the Lord's lot for us. Let us be prepared to sing from the heart along with that uh, blessed hymn writer, H.G. Spafford, that wonderful song, It Is Well With My Soul. Many of us know the heart-touching real-life story of that pious and dedicated businessman, H.G. Spafford. His uh, life history says that he lost most of his real estate wealth in a wildfire in Chicago. And within a year after that, he lost his only son due to scarlet fever. And two years later, his wife and four daughters, they were sailing to England to attend uh, the crusade of D.L. Moody while they were crossing the Atlantic Ocean. The ship collided with another steel sailing ship and all his four daughters drowned to death in that water. His wife miraculously escaped on a, a, a plank. On the way through the same sea route to join his survived wife, the captain of that ship which he was voyaging, he showed the location where four of his daughters along with other 226 people on board lost their life. After watching that area, he just went back to his cabin. And then he wrote that blessed song. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. May the Lord give us the needed grace to maintain this attitude in our life when we face trials and troublesome times in our life. Even as we pass through this pandemic situation, we don't know what is ahead of us. What is our Lord? We don't know, but what the Lord has in store for us, we believe that that's the best. So along with the hymn writer, we will be able to say from the bottom of heart that whatever be my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. May the Lord help us. Moving to the second part of verse 14, which explains about the visit of King Joash 
at Elisha's sickbed. Second Kings chapter 13, verse 14, the second part. Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. We see in the pages of biblical history that Joash was another wicked king of Israel. Even though he did not walk in the ways of God, he had a regard for the prophet of God. So he came to visit Elisha when he was on his sickbed. We see him weeping over the sickness of Elisha. He is addressing him, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. We see here a wicked king taking pain to visit God's prophet Elisha and lamenting over his deadly sickness. A wicked king taking pain to visit God's prophet and lamenting over his deadly sickness. The words of C.H. Spurgeon is very apt and meaningful at this context. I just want to mention the words of uh, C.H. Spurgeon. What he said is, Dear friends, let us seek so to live that even ungodly men may miss us when we are gone. Dear friends, let us seek so to live that even ungodly men may miss us when we are gone. So let's derive our next lesson from this statement. Our fourth lesson our life on earth should be a source of blessing to both believers and unbelievers that they should miss us when we are gone. Our life should be a source of blessing to both believers and unbelievers that they should miss us when we are gone. As dear ones, our short life on earth should be so spent that at least some around us should enjoy the aroma of our life and feel, miss it when we are gone. Our few days on earth, our fleeting time on earth, let it be spent in such a way that at least some around us should enjoy the aroma of our life, the aroma of the sweetness of our God, our Lord, and feel, miss it when we are gone. I remember having read a poem written by Frank Herbert. The title of the poem is Before It's Too Late. That's the title of the poem. It says, if you have a tender message or a loving word to say, do not wait till you forget it. But whisper it today, the tender word unspoken, the letter never sent, the long forgotten messages, the wealth of love and spent. For these, some hearts are breaking. For these, some loved ones wait. So show them that you care for them before it is too late. Yes, dear ones, in this short life on earth, let us shed some light on others' path. Let's lead a help, let's lend a helping hand to the needy. Let's whisper some words of comfort and encouragement in the ears of those who are in distress. Let's spend little time with those who long for our presence so that we may leave an opportunity for others to say something good about us even when we are gone. That's a challenge before us. That's what we need to learn from the situation ahead. That's what we need to be convinced about when we see the uncertainties before us. This short life on earth, we engage to shed some light on others' path. Let us lend a helping hand to some needy who comes across our life. Let's whisper the words of comfort and encouragement in the ears of those who are in distress and in sorrows. Let's spend little time with those who long for our presence, that their heart may be cherished, they may be able to say 
something good about us even when we are gone. As the poet says, let's do it before it is too late. We have a tender message God has given us. We have some loving words that God has given us in our heart by God showing his wonderful love, ineffable love at the cross. And the love of God has been poured into our heart. Let's share it. Let's tell it to others. There are many who are waiting to hear that. There are many hearts breaking who are willing to hear that, craving to hear that. Let's show that we care for them before it's too late. Before it's too late. May the Lord help us. We shall go through the four lessons that we learned today and uh, I will conclude today's class. The first lesson, let us be persistent and importunate before God for our spiritual blessings, but let us be totally submissive to the will of God for our physical and material need. Yes, let us be fully focused on spiritual things in this short life. Let's put our heart and mind on spiritual things. Let us meditate upon, let's love and put up affection on things which are above that this short life may be useful for our master. And the second lesson, the need of the hour is to be steadfast and persistent before God to bring about spiritual blessings out of the worst situation we are in now. We know the things are beyond our control. But everything is in the control of the hands of our God Almighty. Nothing in this world is beyond his control. Let us be engaged in bringing out the best spiritual blessings out of the worst physical situation that God has placed us today. God has a plan and purpose in our life. God will fulfill it. Let's turn our words to the best blessing of our spiritual life. That is what God intends in our life. May the Lord help us to be engaged in that. Lesson three, blessedness of death is not determined by the mode of death, but it is determined by the heavenly estate after the death. All the saved ones will enjoy this blessedness when they die. But as I mentioned, it won't be uniform to all. Let us spend this life loving, obeying, honoring, and serving God so that we may be able to enjoy blessedness of death at its best in the coming eternity. And the last lesson, our life should be a source of blessing to both believers and unbelievers that they should miss us when we are gone. When we die, we know that we leave everything in this world and we enter into the other world. When we die, we leave everything we have in this world and we enter into the other world. But what we are going to leave behind? We will leave everything and go. But what we are going to leave behind when we go? Will there be somebody to say that he or she was blessed by our life. We are blessed by God to be a blessing. Let's continue to remain a blessing to many as long as we live in this world. The present situation, the uncertainty is ahead. The disasters that we see around, all those are pointers. And all those who are really our uh, uh, pointers to, to our life to make us understand the situation and to bring the best out of it. Let's come to our to the Lord. Let's follow the Lord. Let's obey the Lord. Let's love the Lord. Let's serve the Lord. We don't know how much time ahead, but the time that the Lord promised us upon this earth, let's use it for the glory of God so that we'll be able to stand before the Lord on that day with boldness and there'll be few left behind to say that they were blessed out of our life. 
May the Lord bless us with these words. May his name be glorified.